If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to uh, turn to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. We're going to be looking at some different verses. Um, as I said uh, during the welcome, as we have looked over these past couple Sundays, we have tried to determine what are some words that would best describe Christmas, if you just had to take a quick look at Christmas. And we looked at humility as the humble uh, spirit of, uh, and the humble situation of both Mary and Joseph, and then the humility of the Savior in Jesus Christ as he humbled himself to come onto earth and then to give his life for our sins. And then we looked at hardship, all the different hardships that they had uh, in that early Christmas story, and then how also how we deal with hardships in life. But then today, we leave it on, a, on the high note of hallelujah. Christmas, there's a Christmas moment that, uh, that there are some different times where there's this hallelujah that comes in that is just perfect timing. And we know hallelujah moments. Uh, it's the, the birth of a child. It may be getting a, a new job. Uh, it may be getting engaged. It may, heck, it may just be getting a date. Uh, it uh, could be the fact that, that you said, hey, I, I made straight A's. That's a hallelujah moment. And then there's someone else that says, hey, I passed my final. <laughs> That's a hallelujah moment. But there are these hallelujah moments, these times of reaffirmation that, that what we're doing is the right thing. And I think that as a believer in God and a follower of Christ, there are moments in our lives that we need a hallelujah moment. It's a reaffirmation of God's love, of God's presence, and God's power, and God's guidance. We just need to know, am I heading in the right direction? Am I following your will, or have I missed something? I thought that you told me to go this direction, but I'm telling you, I'm needing some reaffirmation. And in this, first, in this Christmas story that we have in Scripture, I believe that when you take a deeper look at it, there were times that Mary and Joseph needed some reaffirmation about is this really what you've called us to do? Is this truly the Son of God that we have given birth to? If you start in Luke uh, chapter 2, uh, in Luke chapter 2, it, it talks to you about uh, how that um, uh, the taxation came in Bethlehem and had to go from Nazareth to, to Bethlehem. And so when you think about it, we talked about this, is that they, they traveled 80 to 90 miles while she is eight and a half, close to nine months pregnant, getting ready to have a child. And then when they get there, there's no room in the inn. There's no place for them to stay. So they stay in a cable or, uh, say, in a cave or a stable and uh, with no cable. Uh, so they're in a, a cave uh, or in a, in a stable area. And she's given birth there. And as she gives birth there, then all of a sudden they've got a, got a, feeding trough to be able to be their bassinet for the child to, to sleep in. And, and you just begin to think about all that they had gone through. And it, to me, it would only be natural for this young teenage couple to be able to ask some questions and wonder, is this really God's child? I mean, I wouldn't have thought it would, it would be like this. And are you telling me that God set up this plan? God set up the fact that we'd have a cave to be born in and a feeding trough to be the, the baby's crib. We're 90 miles away from family and friends. and So I wonder if they just asked themselves, maybe this pregnancy was just a freak of nature. Maybe the joy of giving birth is now being tempered with the wonder of, is this truly the Son of God? But you say, well, yes, they, both Mary and Joseph were visited by an angel that said, you will give birth birth to the Son of God. I understand that. Yes, there was the Immaculate Conception. Yes, I understand that. And yes, uh, Mary's cousin Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, also made claims to that, that you are uh, pregnant with the Son of God. And so some of you may say, well, how could you question that all of this was from God? How could they question it? Well, when you're told that you're giving birth to the Son of God, you probably would say to yourself, no way it's going to be this difficult or this stressful. We are getting ready to give birth and to parent the Son of God. So why in the world are we not at home in Nazareth where we prepared everything? Why are we having to take this journey, sleep in this cave, put this baby in this feeding trough. We've got no family. We've got no friends over here. Do you really think this is the way that God would plan it? And no matter how spiritual you are, 
in your most honest of moments, you would probably ask that same question. And why does this happen? It's because of this statement. When reality does not match up with expectations, doubts will arise. When reality does not match up with expectations, doubts will arise. You see, we all have expectations. And especially when we're looking for God's will and God's direction, and when we feel this is what God's asked me to do, and as we begin to travel that path, all of a sudden, reality doesn't match up with those expectations, and when that happens, doubts begin to arise. And we begin to doubt God's love, we doubt his power, we doubt his presence, and we doubt his plan for our life. I should think it would be this way. And just when you need some reaffirmation that God is directing your path and he's in control, the hallelujah moment comes. They're sitting there, have birth to this child, probably some, they're enjoying this child and the birth of the child, but questions are maybe going through their mind about, this is really the son of God? And then you come up with the shepherds. And if you look in, uh, Matthew, in excuse me, Luke chapter uh, 2, starting in verse 15, and you know, it says the shepherds were in the field just uh, minding their flocks and minding their own business. And all of a sudden, an angel came and told them about this Savior that was going to be born in Bethlehem. And look what it says. It says in verse 15, they said, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They made it known to Mary and to Joseph, and then when they left, they made it known to others. They made this thing known. And can you imagine them showing up to, to Mary and Joseph and they tell them this amazing story. It said, the angels appeared to us. And when the angels appeared, they said that there was a Savior that was born in Bethlehem and that he was to be Christ the Lord. He'd be in swaddling clothes. He'd be lying in a manger. Look at this. He's in swaddling clothes. He's in the manger. Everything they said came true. And then the sky was full of angels and they were praising glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill among men. And they're telling Mary and Joseph this story, and they're going, wow. This is exactly what God said. He said this would be his son, and now he's got not only angels that came to us as individuals, Mary and Joseph, but now all of a sudden, they showed up for the birth, and they told these shepherds, and the shepherds came, and they reaffirmed it, and it was a hallelujah moment. Just when you need some reaffirmation that God is directing your path and that he is in control, he brings in this hallelujah moment. And so how did she respond to this? Well, look at verse 19. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. She treasured up all of these things. That word, when it means to treasure up something, it means to guard from loss, to keep it in mind lest it be forgotten. Today, we would say she wrote it in her journal, or she made a post on Facebook. And so she posted it on Facebook, so she'd always remember it, and set it up so that it would come back up every year on December 25th and be a memory of the baby that was born. She treasured these things up, and it says pondering them. Pondering them is a word that means you put one thing with another in considering the circumstances. That means you go over all the details. You think about, what did the angel Gabriel tell me? What did the angel say uh, to Joseph? I put those together. Now, what did the um, uh, shepherds just say to me that the angels told them? And then she writes all those things down, and she puts all this together. She treasures them in her heart. She ponders all of these things together, and she's reaffirmed that, yes, this is the Son of God, and this is what God is doing, and this is the way he's doing it. Listen, when the reality did not match up with the expectations, the shepherds reaffirmed the fact that this baby is God's son. Hallelujah. And he reaffirmed God's plan, God's love, and God's presence. But then, time kind of went on. It's been about, pick up a story, and it's been 40 days. So, they're sitting there for 40 days looking at their baby, all right? How many of you remember your first 40 days with your very first child? Anybody, can you raise those hands? Some of you are too tired to raise your hand on there. Uh, most of those 40 days, what were you doing? 
I know what Janice and I are doing. Just staring at them. And you're waiting for any little move they make. You, you know it, don't you know it? And they kind of move their hand like this. You said, I've never seen a baby do that. That's incredible. Ours is ahead of the curve. We know that uh, on here. But you're, just, you're staring at that baby. And, uh, and, and today, you know, we're videoing every second of their life, okay? And, and so you're just pondering and you're looking at that baby and wow. But you know, after about 40 days as you've looked at that baby and you keep trying to tell yourself, this is God's son. This is God's son. And they're looking for some indication of deity. And I'm telling you, there's uh, nothing out of the ordinary that's happening with this baby at this time. Uh, I remember we had the opportunity to uh, go to Florence years ago and went to the Uffizi Museum. And we saw where the 14th and 15th century artists such as Giotto and Lorenzetti, and when they would do paintings of Christ, when they do the paintings, they would always put the halo over him. And when people would come and they'd see the baby and they'd go, oh, like this, because he had the halo on his head. Can I just let y'all know, he didn't really have a halo on his head. So it's not like when they were walking around the house when he was 20 days old, they're holding him and say, hey, well, the halo's getting a little heavy over here. He didn't have that. He's just a normal looking baby, just like you and me when we were babies. He cries when he's hungry. He sleeps like any other baby and he needs his diaper changed just like any other baby. There's no great difference from this baby than from any other baby in the neighborhood. So I'm just asking moms and dads, after about 40 days, you know, all the angel stuff is sort of worn off and, and you're sitting there and you're, you're just thinking, son of God, this is the son of God. Maybe they needed a reaffirmation. Well, God provided it. Because what happens is, is when the child is eight days old, he is to be circumcised. And then 33 days after that, the mother is, uh, is unclean. And so she needs to go through a purification rite to be clean again. So after the 40 days after birth, they travel five miles to Jerusalem. And when they get to Jerusalem, they bring an offering. It could be two doves. It could be two pigeons. But they provide the offering. And then they go through the ceremony. And it's the purification ceremony. And as they go up there, they meet a man by the name of Simeon. Now look in verse 25. In verse 25, it says this. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Wow, can you imagine that? This is one guy, this is probably the only guy, well, it's the only guy we know recorded right here, that was told, you will not die until you see the Messiah. So, He's hanging out at the temple, looking to see the Messiah. And it says in verse 27, and he came in the spirit into the temple, and and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God, and he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And in verse 33, and his father and his mother, Joseph and Mary, marveled at what he said about him. Whoa. They come into the temple, and all of a sudden it says they see Simeon, he makes a statement, and they marvel. How did this man know this? Everything that he just said about that child is what the angels had told them, that he would be a savior, and it'd be a savior for all people. And yet this man reaffirmed it right here. Don't you know that five-mile journey from Jerusalem back to Bethlehem was quite the journey? Can you imagine Joseph and Mary talking about this? Can you believe what just happened? This is the Son of God. This 40-day-old baby, this truly is the Son of God. Well, babies grow up. They get to be one, then they get to be close to about two years of age. And then all of a sudden, they get to about two years of age, and mom and dad are sitting there, and they're wondering, so Son of God, this is the Son of God. Because you see, we've been watching this child for two years, and we're really not seeing any deity 
Now, we do believe he's the best kid in the neighborhood. I mean, he is, a, he is a good child on that. But there's like nothing out of the ordinary. It's like when we get ready to put him in the bathwater, he doesn't split the bathwater like the Red Sea. You know, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, whenever he's outside and he's running and he trips, no angels catch him. <clears throat> catch him. He gets a bobo on his knee like every other child on there. So I thought this might be the son of God. And how about those first words? Everybody is waiting for the first words that a child says. Isn't that correct? This is the constant struggle we have between dads and moms. Because every mom wants it to be what? And every dad wants it to be, yeah. And how many of you as dads did your child first say daddy first? Anybody got brave enough to put your hands up? No, nah, not many of you. <laughs> You're such wusses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lauren did. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Now, Janice says it was mom, but I guarantee you, it was dad. You always want to hear what they first said. Well, this is the son of God. They're probably expecting his first words to be the Ten Commandments. They're probably expecting him to be cooing, and then all of a sudden one day say, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, that's a giveaway. This is the son of God. But he didn't. He talked just like any other child. And so you're up here to about two years of age, and you're wondering again, this is son of God. Is this really son of God? Well, God says, well, let me give you a little bit of reaffirmation. And so if you've got your Bibles, if you look left to Matthew chapter 2, when you get to Matthew chapter 2, it's the story of the wise men and the magi. And they come to Bethlehem when the child is about two years old or a little bit younger. And they knock on the door, and all of a sudden, these three wise men, these people of Persian royalty, come to your doorstep, and it says in verse 11, and then with going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All of a sudden, they came out of nowhere, followed the star, came to their house, and gave them the gifts and worshiped the child. Now, I think that when they left, Mary and Joseph had to look at each other and say, wow, wow. <laughs> hey, this truly is the son of God. And what perfect timing. Because that night, God came to Joseph in a dream and he says, you gotta flee. You gotta head to Egypt. It's about 40 miles outside of Herod's jurisdiction. And he said, listen, I know you gotta pack up all your goods and go, and I've just brought you some men that have helped you finance your trip. So uh, you got gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You got everything that you need. You take that and you head down there and set up shop for a while in Egypt. You see, this first Christmas was filled with hallelujah moments, moments of reaffirmation. Yes, this is the Son of God. Yes, the pathway that I put you on is correct. And so let me just kind of take all of this and summarize it by saying, first of all, that Christmas is a hallelujah moment. Christmas itself is a hallelujah moment, and we celebrate this every year. It is a hallelujah moment for two reasons. Number one, globally, it is the hope of salvation. Globally, it is the hope of salvation. Simeon said it best there in chapter two when he says, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you, may, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. During that day, there's only two groups of people, Israel Israel and the rest of the world, Gentiles. And he says, you've been a light to Gentiles and to Israel. God in the flesh has come here, and he's dwelling among his people. The Bible talks about in the words of like he put his tent up here to dwell with his people. And God in the flesh is going to go to the cross, and he's going to die for the sins of all mankind. And he's going to pay a sin penalty for every one of us, but then... As he's taken down from the cross, he'll be placed in a tomb, and three days later, he's raised from the dead. That's what we call Easter Sunday. And the joy and, and the value of Christmas is accelerated when you think about Easter. Because what's so great about Jesus coming to earth is that he then dies on a cross, is raised from the dead, he conquers sin, he conquers death, he ascends to heaven, and he provides a way for all of us to have a relationship with God and to spend eternity with him in heaven. And so Simeon was right. It's a light to the Gentiles and to the, the glory of Israel. It's a salvation for all people. Globally, it is the hope of salvation. 
That is why we give our money to go towards missions, to send the message out around the world. That is why we leave the comforts of our homes and we go into other areas to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ so that they can have the opportunity to receive eternal life and be able to give God the praise and glory that he deserves. And those are hallelujah moments. You see, it's, Christmas is a hallelujah moment because globally it's the hope of salvation. But second of all, individually, it's a relationship with God. Individually, it is a relationship with God. And that is what is so cool, is that when you think about that God stepped out of heaven, sent his son here, put on flesh, 100% God, 100% man, so that we could have a relationship with God. And Jesus said that in order for you to do this, you have to be born again, and that is the rebirth. So in order to have a relationship with God, Christmas, when I think about it, I think about rebirth that I have to myself make the decision to receive Jesus as Savior. And when I make that call, Jesus says you must be born again. You become a totally new creation. The old dies and the new steps up. There's a rebirth that takes place. And whenever that happens, this gift of new birth, it is a hallelujah moment. It talks about the angels in heaven rejoice when a sinner comes to the Lord. Rebirth. We can have a relationship with God in this Christmas moment, this hallelujah moment, is when you do that. It's when you recognize that the old self has died, new things have come, it is a praise God hallelujah moment. And it'd be my hope, this time, Christmas 2018, if you've never made a decision to receive Christ as your Savior, if you've never come to that point to where you understand that it's my sins, the things I've done wrong that have separated me from a holy God, And then no matter how many good things I try to do, no matter how many acts of service I do at Christmas, no matter how many big gifts I buy for my family, none of that will even come close to crossing this gulf of separation between me and a holy God. And the only thing that can happen is that somebody has to pay for my sins. And the only person who can pay for my sins is someone who's lived a perfect life, and Jesus lived that perfect life. And he went to the cross to die for all of our sins. You say, why would he do this? Because he loves us. And because God loves us. And it's his desire to be in a relationship with us. And because he's a holy God, he's also a just God, but he's also a merciful God. And so there has to be that sacrifice. And so when Jesus provided that sacrifice and then he was buried, then what God did is is my son did exactly what he was supposed to do. And three days later, takes him out of the grave, raises him up to life, appears to over 500 people, gives final instructions to his disciples and says, go in the world and tell the good news to everybody. Start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, hit Samaria, and go to the innermost parts of the world. And that is the rebirth that can happen. It can happen in your life where you could do that today to where you could make that decision and say, Jesus, I'm ready for you to come into my life. Boy, and when that happens, it's a rebirth. It's a whole new ball game. You got the power of God living in you, being able to walk the path that he wants you to walk. And for some of you, you need to do that today. That's the greatest gift that you could ever receive, and it's the greatest gift you could ever give to your family and to your friends, is to begin to do that. That's rebirth. But the second part is reaffirmation. Majority of us that are here today are people who've made that decision for Christ. But when I think about Christmas, I think about the reaffirmation. As you follow the Christmas story, you see that God has reaffirmed his will and his plan for Mary and in Joseph. At times, they could have been wavering. God stepped in and reaffirmed his plan. At times, they could have hesitated in following his will, and God in his omniscience came in and reaffirmed him just at the right time. What if Joseph had decided to hesitate and not leave Bethlehem and say, today's not a good day, let's wait next week? He would have left his own son in danger because Herod was sending his army to kill every child that was two years and under. But God reaffirmed his omniscience. Joseph was ready. Christmas hallelujah moments are reminders that God does the same for us. There are times when doubts creep in, our faith wavers, and then God discloses himself in a special way to reaffirm our faith. There will be times when you will be asked to take a major step of faith, a major disruption in your life, And God does something to reaffirm his presence and his omnipotence. 
This is just the way God works. It's not like he throws it out and says, hey, this is what I want you to do. I'll back off and I'm gone. No, he's with you every way. And he knows when that wavering begins to happen. And guess what he does? He says, let me reaffirm this over here. Let me give you a hallelujah moment to help you to continue down that pathway. Hallelujah moments. God reminds us of the importance of relationships, the consequences of eternity, and the incredible value of every day. But last of all, hallelujah moments come through various means. So how did these happen, Danny? How do you get these hallelujah moments? Well, they come through some different ways. First of all, they come through setbacks. Sometimes hallelujah moments come through setbacks. And that's when you just get knocked down. And you get down so low that the only thing you can do is look up. And as you see God, he reaffirms his presence and his power. How many of you have heard testimonies of people that have shared their relationship with God and they said, I had to get so low that all I could do was look up. Prodigal son, spent all his money, wasted his life, he's there in the pig pen, he's eating stuff that the pigs are eating. He said, it can't get any lower than this. And when he finally came to his senses, he then went back to his father. And for some of you, the hallelujah moment will be, you just keep going down that path and you keep getting lower and lower and lower and lower and further and further away. You just keep digging a deeper and deeper hole until finally, maybe you'll finally get to the bottom low enough to where you look up and say, you know what? God's really all I've got. And years ago, I decided to follow him. But today I am this, I am so far away from him. And it could be in that setback that God reaffirms. He says, you know what? I still love you. I still got a plan for your life. And from that hallelujah moment, you begin to make your way back to him and back to that plan. It could be success. Could be success. It's a reminder of God's providence and provision. And, uh, and when that happens, my response is to give him a huge high five, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And that God put you on a particular direction and he poured out his blessings on you and through that success, it just reaffirms we're going the right path. Everybody needs some W's. Everybody needs some wins, okay? And God will give you that and all of a sudden out of that success, you get excited. I got an email uh, early this morning from uh, R.C. Sylvanus. Maybe we know him. We've been supporting him. Uh, planning a Nepali-speaking church in Queens, New York. And he came up with this incredible idea that I want to do a Christmas celebration for our community. And we don't really have any space to house it. So I approached some people and they agreed that we could have it in the basement of a Buddhist temple. Now, that's not where a lot of Christmas celebrations are happening uh, in these days. But in the basement of a Buddhist temple, his goal was to have 100 people. He had over 100. His goal was to have 50 unbelievers. He had over 50 unbelievers that showed up down there. And he had to, they told him he couldn't preach the gospel, so in a creative way he explained this Christmas story that filtered out in there to where at least every person in there got to understand a little bit of the gospel in there. And so he sends me this email this morning just rejoicing and praising God. A guy who started out with just a handful of people and over these five, six years, now all of a sudden, uh, there were over 50 non-believers that were there and over 100 people in their community that he was able to speak to and began to build these relationships with. I mean, this is a hallelujah moment for R.C. Sylvanus and for his wife on there. It's incredible. I just want to thank one of our Sunday school classes one of our Sunday school classes sent close to $1,200 to them, and they were able to use that to provide gifts and things for all the people that were there. So again, it's just people coming together. And that takes you to the third one, that's service. Hallelujah moments sometimes can come through various means, and sometimes it just comes through service. Of when you serve others, God seems to at times just affirm his love, his presence with you. And it's like there's, there's never a greater time, it seems like, than when we are able to serve others. I got to be a part of this um, yesterday, uh, excuse me, uh, Friday. Uh, a, as you know, in our city, uh, of the, the shooting that took place at the Galleria, and, and it's just a lot of unrest on theirs. They're waiting for all the facts to come out. 
And a couple of weeks ago, uh, Buddy Gray, a uh, pastor at Hunter Street, uh, a uh, white pastor at, uh, uh, at Hunter Street, partnered with Mike McClure, an African-American pastor at The Rock Church. And uh, both these guys love God. They're there. They uh, care about Hoover, care about Birmingham. And they came together. And they uh, sent out an invitation to pastors, white and black, all over to come and meet at Hunter Street. We met over there a few weeks ago, a time of prayer and a time of challenge. And, and then they stood up and they said, you know, it, it's not our responsibility to try to deal with the legal issues or the investigation. But listen, there are people that are getting hurt by this. Because when the people protest, then it means that some people aren't going to the Galleria or aren't going to the shops right over there in Hoover. And many of those people who worked there, they were counting on making money to be able to buy their own Christmas gifts. And some of these businesses are shutting down or reducing hours, and so these people, you know, are suffering. So what can we do as pastors and churches is let's help the people. And so they came up with the help of a bank and some attorneys. They put together a plan that we could raise money, and their goal was $25,000, and they raised $30,000. And our church gave uh, some funds towards that. And churches all over provided funds, and the funds were going to go to these people who work, but yet their hours got cut back, and so they lost out on pay. And they vetted it. They had a very detailed vetting system. Uh, to, to even to the point to where if you said, I work at so-and-so, they would contact the employer and get a copy of your pay stub to make sure. I mean, it was, it was very detailed. And they uh, <clears throat> identified about 70 people who contacted them, and then they got back with them. They said, from 10 to 2, we'll be down at the Christian Service Mission, uh, where Tracy Hips runs all that. And uh, we're going to come down, and uh, you can come and pick up some Christmas gifts. We've also got a check for you. And Tracy and CSM, they provided all of these Christmas gifts out there. And there was a group for little girls, group for little boys, and then uh, for younger children, older children, all across there. And I got the opportunity to go down there, and there's some of our other members that were there that were helping out, and I was like a Santa's helper. And what that is, I get to carry a trash bag, and I'm good at that. I'm telling you, I am the trash guy at our house. Nobody takes trash out but me. And so I've got a big black trash bag, and a young lady comes out. She gives them her car. She says, I've got one child. It's a 15-month-old child. And they said, okay, you get to get three gifts. And so we walk around, and she gets to pick out three gifts. She puts three gifts in there. Then we walk over, and you pick out whatever wrapping paper you want. She kisses the wrapping paper. Then you walk over here, and there's a wrapping station, and they wrap all the presents, put the bows on them, make them look nice, put them in the bag. Now, what's so ingenious about this is when they bring their children, they take them into a break room, and they leave the children with some uh, care workers so they won't know that these presents are being bought for them. And so they're in there drawing pictures, eating cookies, doing all that great stuff. And then once she's done that, then she goes and she picks up her child to get ready to take her gifts to the car. And then they've got food for her. They've got a big turkey. They've got a, a basket of food. And, and they said, we want to provide this for you too. And then when they do all that, then they turn around and they hand her a check for $400. And they say, Merry Christmas. Man, I'm telling you, you talk about some emotions out there of people who had no idea how they were going to provide Christmas just because of the situation they were in. And to see people coming together, white and black, coming together, people bringing their kids up there to, to help be Santas and, and to be these shoppers for all of them. It was just, it was a, it was a beautiful sight. And you saw in their faces, it was like a, a hallelujah moment for them. And it, a number of these people are people who have walked with God but had no idea what was going to happen to them during this Christmas season. And because pastors and churches came together just to put their arms around them and said, hey, we're going to help you through this time. Hallelujah moment. Solitude is the fourth one. Solitude. Getting away, just you and God, and letting him speak to you outside the noise of daily life and remind you of who he is and whose you are. Some of the greatest hallelujah moments that can vastly alter your direction in life and your next steps is just solitude. That means putting your phone off, just getting away, and just getting with God. And God can just reaffirm his presence with you during this. And last of all is scripture. God's word, it's active and it's living. And as you read through scripture, there will be times when verses of scripture will jump out at you and it is like, God, this is the exact verse I need. Many of you, 
Many of you have sent me notes or did tear-offs or so just talking about your own walk with God, about how you read a particular verse and it was exactly what you needed on that day and that God specifically spoke to you and he reaffirmed his love, his presence, and his plan with you. God does that. He doesn't just wind us up and let us go. He walks with us all along the way. Reaffirmation. Hallelujah moments. Christmas is a time of hallelujahs. We praise God for the gift of his son and the opportunity to experience a new birth. And as I said earlier, today could be your day for the new birth. Today could be your day for the new birth. Whenever I close this sermon in just a moment, uh, I will give you the opportunity to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. And there's a place on that commitment card where you could check that box and say, hey, today I prayed to ask Jesus or I'd like to talk to someone about that. But for most of us, today is a day for reaffirmation, a day to recall those hallelujah moments where God has showed up, showed out, and today you remember those and you praise him. Wouldn't it be great to take just a few moments to think about those times when he showed up in a major way just when you need it? Or it could be as some of you are trudging through a deep valley of uncertainty and you desperately need a hallelujah moment. Christmas is a time where God reaffirms his love for you and the fact that he has a plan for your life and that no matter how far you may have strayed for him, his love and his plan are still here for you. So in the midst of the humble settings and the hardships of that first Christmas, God showed his faithfulness by providing hallelujah moments to reaffirm his love and his plan for the life of Mary and Joseph and their child. This Christmas, that same God does the same thing for you. He wants to reaffirm his love to you, reaffirm his presence, reaffirm his power, and reaffirm his plan that he has for your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that when we look at the Christmas story that we see your hand throughout all of it. And we see the power and the giving of your son, Jesus Christ, and we rejoice with that, but we also see how you reaffirmed each step along the way. And you did that for Mary and Joseph, and you do the same thing for us. Lord, there's some people here today who, who don't have a reaffirmation because they don't even have a rebirth. And their desire would be to start this Christmas being your child, being a part of your family. And I just pray now, Lord, if there's anyone out here that desires to make that decision, that they would look to you and just pray a prayer similar to this, of Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that my sins have separated me from you. But I know that you sent your son to die on the cross for me because you love me and you want me to have a relationship with you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life to save me from my sins and to let me walk with you and to be your child. And Father, if anyone prays that, your word says that if we ask you to save us, that you will answer that prayer. And so I thank you for those answers. And then for others, Lord, who are just needing a word of reaffirmation, I pray that through this message or just through anything today, it could be a Sunday school lesson that they hear, it could be a song that was sung, it could have been a prayer that's been prayed, that you would use any of those things to be able to just kind of like tapping them on the shoulder and reaffirming, I'm here, I've not left you, and I love you, I am a powerful God, I'll always be present with you, and I have a powerful plan for your life. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.